Nine men now facing charges after police say they dug a secret tunnel into the sanctuary of an Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn. In 1914, in the Beaux-Arts style, just like Grand Central Terminal and Michigan Central Station, it has been a very busy building throughout its history. And over the years, mystery has widely surrounded this building. You see, locals have observed much of it to be empty, an observation that would raise important questions. For example, if this postal office is so busy and so important, yet mostly empty, where does all the mail actually get processed? The answer comes from a set of buildings just down the block on 9th Avenue, where you will find the Morgan Processing and Distribution Center, the U.S. Peace's largest sorting facility. It is a massive complex of buildings, taking up two entire city blocks, processing all the mail going in and out of the postal office previously. The Morgan Center and the Farley Post Office were connected by a freight railway which crossed a viaduct. But when it fell out of use, another route of travel was needed, and considering how close these two facilities are together. The natural response would probably be simple, like take the mail down the road, but with the hustle and bustle of city life and roads clogged with traffic, that's much easier said than done. So a tunnel was dug between the two facilities generally following 9th Avenue, and that is where the mail flowed. This mail tunnel served its purpose, well, until at which point the hauling of mail ceased as the New York state government began talks to purchase the Farley building and transform it into a train hall. Naturally, after the tunnel's closure, they fell into abandonment and despair. The stairs and elevators leading below ground were sealed shut and rats began to infest the vacant space. Finally, the Farley building also contains an entrance to tracks from Penn Station, which is yet again another building that we've talked about on previous episodes, though it was never used for passenger service. This forgotten tunnel was swept and secured by the Secret Service with the intention of it being used during the Pope's 2015 visit. But that's about all we know. This tunnel has met a very similar fate to the Farley Morgan Mail Tunnel, as all of its entrances have been sealed. The city even went as far as welding shut manholes to make sure that absolutely nobody could get inside. Now let's head back over to Brooklyn where we will discover the tunnels that once supported a swimming pool that accommodated thousands and thousands of people at a time. From 1903 to 1905, the city of New York Brooklyn's abandoned pool tunnels acquired four plots of land in Brooklyn, surrounded by all sorts of industrial works, chemical plants, iron works, and more. These plots of land would be developed into a park, first known as Greenpoint, park being renamed to McCarran Park in 1909. After Patrick Henry McCarran, a popular politician who passed away in that same year, initially being a collection of playgrounds and athletic facilities, the park gradually expanded adding more facilities and gardens as the 20th century rolled forward by 1936 as part of President Roosevelt's New Deal. The WPA, or Works Progress Administration, built 11 state-of-the-art pools in New York City, one of which was the McCarran Park Pool. The pool was quite nice, even by today's standard. This pool offered a gigantic capacity of 6,800 swimmers, with filtration and heating systems all controlled by an enormous boiler room. This boiler room was connected to an even more enormous tunnel system all the way around the perimeter to keep systems in check. This pool was so modern that it even had underwater lighting, which was unheard of for the time. Well, the pool was a hit and a major social hub for the community. By 1984, it had fallen into a poor state and hence was closed. But the tunnel system remained circling directly beneath the pool deck and with an entrance to both the boiler and filtration room. The tunnel is almost as impressive as the pool itself, lying abandoned for 20 years until the pool came to be used as a concert and entertainment venue. Amazingly, by 2012, the pool had been refurbished and was reopened this time with a capacity of 1,500 swimmers. It isn't as large as it once was. The diving pool has been filled in and converted into a volleyball court, and some of the 100-year-old tunnel system is still utilized. But much of it sits untouched and abandoned right under the park. Now let's discuss a tunnel for the Columbia University Tunnel's academic elitist, with the story leading up to its existence and ultimate abandonment being simply unbelievable bull hall is an oddity among the buildings of Columbia University. 
and many feel it does not fit in with the rest of the buildings at the college. Indeed, it has a very unusual past in 1769. A student of the Columbia University, by the name of Dr. Samuel Bard, gave a speech that inspired the creation of a hospital, thanks to fundraising efforts by Henry Moore, the province of New York's royal governor. The hospital was fully established in 1771. This hospital had a wing for mental illness, which was thought to be sufficient in capacity. But by the turn of the century, the amount of cases had risen to the point that expansion was required. Thus, the lunatic asylum was constructed in 1808, with the absence of hospital in the name being no mistake. It was designed as an 80-bed refuge from the rest of the complex, while asylum would have been considered to be even worse than the name hospital. By today's standards, the New York Lunatic Asylum was actually one of the first mental institutions to reign in the restraining equipment commonly associated with mental health treatment of the time, such as straitjackets. In 1820, a lack of space forced, yet another expansion this time to a 26-acre farm next to Bloomingdale Road, which is now known as Broadway. So in a year, the Bloomingdale Asylum opened with a separate building for women. Open six years later, these asylums continued the practices of their predecessors, focusing on what they called quote-unquote moral treatment rather than medical treatment. In some cases, granting greater freedom to their patients at a time when the standard of mental health treatment was often locking the patient up and throwing away the key. Though that's not to say they were a moral bastion by any means. From today's standard, for example, their primary form of restraint was a long sleeve shirt with leather hand shackles. Formally, they prohibited the use of straight jackets, but they did make frequent use of the quote-unquote tranquilizer chair, in which an overactive patient would be seated in a heavy wooden chair, strapped down at the chest, abdomen, knees, ankles, and wrists. Then a wooden box would be placed over their head. This was all done to allow for easier bloodletting, which was a common treatment at the time. And although it's probably rather obvious, it's been proven to be medically pointless today by 1839, financial difficulties forced the asylum to focus on profit and the treatment quality suffered greatly. In 1872, Julius Chambers wrote a number of pieces for the New York Times, revealing that the asylum had lost their commitment to morale treatment. He documented closed cells, uncomfortable beds and chairs, foul food, filthy baths, all run by rude and vulgar attendants while the controversies did put a dent in the activities of the institution. The financial issues were inevitably what put the asylum under the nearby neighborhood. Began putting pressure on the undesirable asylum in their backyard, and cost of living began to rise. So the asylum had to shut its doors and sell off its land. This is when Columbia took possession of the land between 116th and 120th Street. Looking to expand the campus to new areas, the university had most of the buildings torn down, so next to none of Bloomingdale Asylum was left, and as far as most people are concerned, the only remnant left is Buell Hall. But what they fail to realize is that there were also plenty of tunnels from the asylum left behind. Almost no one realizes it, but beneath the asylum was a system of tunnels connecting all the buildings in the complex together after the university purchased the grounds. These tunnels remained. The tunnels were used during World War II for wartime research and were said to have assisted in the United States Manhattan Project, aiding in the creation of the most powerful weapon humanity has ever seen. There was also a short period before 1957 that the tunnels were used as a pedestrian walkway, but after the college walk was constructed they fell out of use again in that regard. As well one more major point in history, that these tunnels were used was around the time of the Vietnam War. You see, the military draft began to greatly increase in scale, putting in 2.2 million people between 1965 and 1970. And in that time, students became enraged as some claimed that the university had sent out the class rankings to draft boards with the intention of removing underperforming students from the campus and sending them overseas. While this practice concluded in 1967, the next year would see the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and cities across America went mad. This anger combined with other strong social tensions on campus detonated into a series of protests in late March of 1968. These protests climaxed with the occupation of many of the university's buildings, which happened multiple times throughout the year of 1968. Throughout these protests, students would use the tunnels to communicate with other buildings, 
making sure that no sudden development was unknown and that no group was left out of the loop. Ironically, the tunnels would also play a key role in the administration reclaiming their buildings. The tunnels beneath Columbia University remain there to this day, and while more and more passages are being blocked as time goes on, people continue to explore, while the tunnel's origins remain a mystery. Some explorers have found markings on I-beams in the tunnel dating back as far as July of 1885. Sometimes history remains half-written, I suppose. If you liked it and want more of these, be sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and click on ring the bell so you don't miss new ones issues.